Gautner. Thank you very much. I'm joined in by Rick Moraine there. I'm Chuck Offenberger, if I haven't met you. I'm, uh, I'm one of the board members of the Greene County Historical Society, and I'll be the master ceremonies here this afternoon. Uh, for those who are able, please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Well, thanks again to our musicians. They'll be able to both be back here later in the program, but Rick Moraine and Wayne Lautner stepped up with a lot of rehearsal this week on this and just pulled that together <laughs> sensationally. <laughs> I tell you, it's, I'm awestruck by people that have talent like that. Um, you know, when I come into this building, um, I'm always struck by, you know, how well done the, the exhibits are, how much information is in here, but even more than that, how much work has gone into making this museum as fantastic as it is. It's just really awesome. And it's even more so when you realize that all, nearly every bit of this has been done by volunteers over all these years. Really, if going back to the 1960s is when the Historical Society started. So it's been, it's been a fantastic amount of work. And we're all gathered here today, really, to honor one of the greatest of all of our volunteer workers in, uh, when it comes to Greene County history, James H. Jim Andrew. Um, he not only has volunteered to do a lot of the physical work that's gone into preserving history, not only in this building, but all over this county, uh, He's also taken on the responsibility, just, just out of a love of history, of doing deep research on all kinds of people, places, and events that make up our Greene County history. And I don't know where we'd be had he not decided to do that some time ago. So uh, that's why we're here today, is to uh, salute Jim for all the work he's done over that time. And it's been, a, it's been a lot of fun, as you're gonna hear as this, as this program goes on here today. We have several presenters that will be telling you a little bit about that. I want to, in the first part of our program here, we're going to show a, a, about a 10 minute video clip and there's a little story that goes with this. Um, I found myself over the time that Carla and I have lived in this community that when I've done stories that involved all kinds of things in the county, when I needed to know something uh, in a hurry uh, about something that happened a long time ago or just get some historical perspective, I could call Jim Andrew and he was just amazing. I mean, he's just been amazing how he could tell, give me the, exactly what I needed in colorful quotes often too, <laughs> and uh, just worked right into my stories. And so as uh, time went on, I thought, this, this has got to be preserved however we can do it. And we, of course, there's several ways we're preserving our history and preserving Jim's knowledge. But one of the things is I talked to Jim Dobbendick at Jefferson Telecom into sponsoring a project late this summer, this fall, in which I've sat down with Jim in his house uh, and we have done um, interviews over the totality of Greene County history as only Jim Andrew could tell it. We divided it into four periods, pre-settlement to about 1890, 1890 through World War I, uh, then eight, uh, World War I in the 1920s through World War II, and then from, the 1950, from 1950 to the present times today. And I'll tell you the stories have just been riveting over eight hours of conversations on videotape that Sean Seaborn has chronicled for us. And uh, we're going to carve that down and edit it. So we've got four documentaries that will run on uh, local cable television. And then we'll have copies of those here in the museum and at the Jefferson Public Library, so they'll be available from now on. Uh, it was just, it's a, been a wonderful project, but that's what you're going to see in the first 10 minutes of this. You're going to see just a quick sample of that, of, uh, from those conversations, and it will kind of set the tone for what's coming here today. So, Sean, if you want to pull the screen up and we'll be ready to go. Jim Andrew, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time. Um, I've always thought of you since the, I moved to Greene County some eight years ago. I've tapped you several times for your historical knowledge. I've always thought of you of Green, as Greene County's Mr. History. Um, 
But uh, one of the things that uh, I think the Greene County Historical Society has done a pretty good job of is in many ways they've made history fun uh, and interesting. And you seem to have a real knack of that. Uh, tell me just how about your love of history. When did that develop? Oh, I would say, Chuck, that I've always had a great interest, even as a young boy. I, of course, I had uh, lots of uh, great aunts and great uncles, and they had uh, many stories to tell about uh, the early days of uh, Greene County. And, of course, I was all ears and uh, would remember the incidents that they came up with. And, of course, uh, as I uh, grew up, I, of course, I was in an area where there was quite a bit of Greene County history, the first courthouse and Anderson School and that type of thing. Where, uh, right in our neighborhood. And for people who don't know, this is, you told, we're telling me it's like five miles southeast of Jefferson. Yeah, uh, yeah five miles southeast. Which is where the, uh, the county was really, the settlers originally came. Yes, they came and settled along the rivers because they uh, uh, needed to have the timber mm -hmm. for wood and for building a shelter. And uh, uh, then, of course, the prairie land was uh, impossible to farm at that time because it was too wet, too many potholes and one thing or another. So you had uh, the first uh, 30 years in Greene County was largely settlement along the Raccoon River and particularly from Jefferson to the southeast corner of the county. Well now as you grow up hearing these stories uh, that hearing your family tell and others tell uh, and begin to get an appreciation for history um, the Greene County Historical Society was founded in about the 1960s sometime uh, thereabouts uh, and were you, did you get involved in that from the beginning? Uh, well, not too much I guess at that time. I tell you I was uh, uh, starting to expand my farming operations uh -huh. and pretty much tied up with that so to speak in the 1960s. Uh, but Over the years uh, you've donated many many items to the museum uh, both at the down to, or at the museum proper and then at the fairgrounds the equipment and everything out there. A couple other things that you're going to forever be remembered for I'm sure. One was the historical monuments that you have uh, were involved in in uh, researching and then placing those around the county. Was this about in the 70s? Well, that uh, took place in 1975, was the beginning of it. We had a uh, meeting of people from throughout the county in Jefferson about six months ahead of the bicentennial coming up in 1976. Right. And this particular group was to plan for the bicentennial celebration. Of course, uh, we got all sorts of opinions of what we could do for excitement. But it came down basically in the end that people wanted to buy a whole lot of fireworks and have a big noise and then that would be it. And uh, I uh, kind of felt that we should do something a little bit more permanent. And I made the suggestion that we ought to mark the historical sites in Greene County. And one particular person there that I think was probably a newcomer to the county said nothing ever happened here. Oh yeah, this is a great story. And so what became, what happened after that? Well, that really fired me up to <laughs> <laughs> prove my point. Because you are, at this point, are you a third or fourth generation resident of the county then? I mean, Yes, in most cases I'd be about fourth generation. Okay, so you knew some things that happened. So what did you do? Well, I envisioned that the best source of information was, of course, uh, E.B. Stillman's 1907 History of Green County, and then the Green County newspapers, particularly the Bee and Herald. So I got a, a collection of four by six note cards, and I went through these papers in the fall of uh, 1975, spent considerable time reading all those old papers, wow. coming up with things that I thought were of historical interest. Were you doing this at the library? or at the No, Bee I would carry office? the papers home. Most of my, they would allow me to uh, remove them and bring them. The home. Moraines would. Or, yes. Yeah. Uh huh. Wow. Yes, uh huh. And Fred Moraine was the uh, chairman of the uh, uh, bicentennial group for the county, so he was all for it. So anyway, when I finished up, I, I uh, had a short history written on these cards. <laughs> Note and, cards. Uh huh. Usually, kind of a one-liner type of deal. 
and then mm -hmm. I also uh, had them dated and when it got all through with it why I arranged all the cards in chronological order of how the events happened and then I uh, came up with the uh, history here which uh, has uh, a map showing the sites and uh, then on the reverse side why it has all these various incidents that I came up with that well, I thought were of interest. And I know um, Home State Bank uh, had that printed, it, I think, and um, it has been reprinted two or three or four times over the years. Yes, they have uh, reprinted it three times, I Not believe, in my recollection. I think the first printing was for 8,000 uh, copies and they were given to the school children of uh, the county and then have been used elsewhere. And then the uh, DNR had uh, a reprinting made of it maybe uh, 10, 15 years ago, to, particularly to give to people that were visitors at Spring Lake. And right. Kind of um, give them something. And this, I, I would note that this is a really important document for anybody interested in Greene County history because it's, it's very thorough, it's very entertaining, and it, you know, <laughs> it makes you want to go see all these sites. So that's a remarkable contribution you made to uh, local history. But then that sort of led to the placement of those historical markers. That's how I see and you had the Sloan brothers involved in helping engrave and all yeah. these things. Well, it was one of those deals that uh, we put in 12 of the markers in the summer of 1976. And uh, that was quite a task. We had a, a plywood form that I had made and it would adjust where it could be longer for uh, a particular site that had a longer story to be told and uh, I had some excellent volunteers particularly uh, Virgil Averill and Del Swicky who both had been concrete workers and had a lot of experience in handling concrete and uh, knowing when you could remove the forms and so forth. So but you'd build a concrete base and then you'd put a top on it that would have the historical story. Uh huh. Is that right? Yes, we get the uh, uh, Sloan brothers uh, engrave a granite slab that went on the uh, top. And of course, uh, granite is uh, something that ought to be around for a thousand years. You know, it must tickle you today because, you know, I notice this when I'm going down the road and I know where some of those markers are. And frequently you'll see somebody park their car standing out there reading it. That's got to tickle you when you see that. Well, it is entertaining. Of course, it's one of those things that I've enjoyed the, the number of people that would tell me how they would have uh, uh, relatives come back. And of course, it's an entertaining jaunt for people that have lived here years ago to uh, go out and visit these various sites and uh, reminisce about their childhood and uh, things that happened in their family. Um, when I said, when I opened up here and I said, do you have a knack of making history fun or knowing the stories that seem to appeal to people? I suppose this is the all-timer. And I think this is what people will really remember. In 1976, uh, tell us about this. You and Jim, your son, James O. You are James H. Andrew, and he is James O. Andrew. Um, got these uniforms and tell us what you did with this cannon that we see here. Well, we had quite an exciting time of it. Uh, my son and I uh, uh, made a program that was probably about uh, oh, 45 minutes in length and it was a rapid moving thing, but we had uh, ourselves equipped as uh, <laughs> people would have been during the Revolutionary War. I had the uh, uh, costume here with the red vest and the you still hat, got the hat, hat here. red plume and uh, this would have been a, a colonel in artillery in the uh, Revolutionary War and my son was dressed in a uh, linen frock coat and he would have been typical of the frontiersman with his coontail hat and so forth and uh, we had a lot of weapons and artifacts that went along with it <laughs> and so uh, we could put on a rapid moving uh, program where I'd say a two or three sentences about something and then he'd come in with two or three sentences on something and we went back and forth and we put this program on for uh, anyone that would ask us 
without charge. And I think we did 56 presentations of it. In the, in the in, bicentennial in, year. Yeah, in the bicentennial year. And that was all the way from uh, Rippy School Kids to uh, uh, Rotary Club at Fort Dodge. <laughs> but you, no. and would you shoot the cannon? No, we didn't take the cannon with us. Uh, I had that displayed here in my yard, and uh, it remained here. But uh, we uh, did have uh, uh, his flint rock rifle and uh, the type of canteen that they carried at that time, and a tomahawk and uh, and so on, and uh, showed those things off. And of course, there were a lot of smaller things that were quite interesting. You, uh, obviously, with these presentations, you really brought history alive to a lot of people. <laughs> and I think, you know, uh, we're going to talk later in this program today about your interest in railroad history and, and some of the work you've done there and the fantastic museum you've endowed over at Boone. So we'll have a presentation on that a little later today. But it seems to me that that's what you have really done through a lot of your work, is you have made history come alive for people today. What, um, what do we need to do in the future with, uh, as far as Greene County history? What do we need to be thinking about to, that we're going to have to do in the future? Well, I tell you, it's one of those things that uh, we never should let it go as long as it did on having I mean, a written county history. We went from uh, uh, Stillman in 1907 until we published a book here just recently. And of course, that's too far. I mean, every f 50 years at least, why a real formal county history should be made because there are people that come and go and a hundred years you just lose sight of a lot sure. of them. But it is a, a good thing and you'd be surprised that with the interest in genealogy yeah. how many people you come seeking information on old time relatives and so forth and boy if you've got a history book where you can open it up and present just what the person did. Why? wonderful thing for those families. And I suppose it's important we got to make it available to young to students as they're in the schools. Oh yes, yes, yes. I think it's uh, one of those things that uh, the uh, future is forecast by the history in our past, you know, because things like history repeats itself, so. <laughs> okay, so use of those tile pipes, what did that do in this county? Well, the uh, uh, agricultural land here would never amount to anything if we hadn't been able to get rid of the excess water. And Hard to imagine that today, isn't it? Yes, I mean, it surely you know, is. It's one of the most yeah. fertile places on earth, yeah. and, and it what wouldn't have happened if, <laughs> without a whole lot of hard physical labor. Yeah. Really. No, okay. and the tile is hidden. People don't realize that it's there. They don't realize what it's doing for us, and uh, I suppose someday it's going to have to be replaced and it's going to be a real expensive oh, burden boy. when that comes up and <laughs> that's right. entail a lot of expense. Going back to that one little incident where somebody in 1975 or 76 as you're getting ready for the bicentennial celebration said nothing ever happened here interesting. <laughs> I mean I guess you have spent the next 40 years disproving that. <laughs> so it was innocent enough on his part I think he's probably somebody that came here from some other community and of course maybe hadn't been here only a few years but uh, it is interesting to go back because uh, it takes so many people to make a thriving community and it takes a lot of leadership from people to get things done you know. Well I guess whoever that guy was that said that back <laughs> when we owe him a debt of thanks just from, from the fact that he got you launched and got you into history. We thank you for your stories. Thank you for your work over all these years. You've been a great contributor to the Greene County Historical Society. Well, thank you. I enjoyed visiting with you about it, Chuck. Okay. Well, there we are. Uh, that gives you a sample of what's to come. We'll be able to, be able to spend a lot of time this winter as, we, as it gets cold outside uh, listening to Jim and Andrew tell those stories of all, all our Greene County history. Uh, we're going to go in now into this program uh, just kind of rapid fire with three or four different presenters who are going to talk about just a briefly about different aspects of uh, Jim Andrews work for the Green County Historical Society and we're going to lead off here with Jean Burke who's the president of the Green County Historical Society so I'm going to use the mic yeah we I'm want you to use in. the mic do you want to stand up or you want to sit down no I'll stand okay if you'll do that for me I've got another mic here yep. a lot of mics <laughs> Thank you. I don't 
think you want to be too close to it. Um, I want to welcome you all today, and I want to start by saying how privileged I am to be part of this program. And um, I want to thank Jim for all the exhibits that he's given us um, through the years for the museum. And I want to talk about a few of them. And I already think between Chuck's introduction and the video that they've stolen my show. <laughs> but um, <coughs> we have in the, the back room, we have a coal mine. And the coal mine was in the old museum over on State Street in the basement and rather small. But when we moved here, um, we, Jim was given a much larger space for the coal mine and he and a builder friend of his put it together and it is lit and the signage tells the story of coal mining in Greene County. Um, on the wall outside there's a photo gallery of mining and um, there's a case below it that has mining artifacts in it that are not in the coal mine per se. So the coal mine is one of our big attractions here. And many people did not know that there was mining in Greene County. And some of those people are Greene County people. So, and then they've already talked about the tiling. And the tiling exhibit is back there also. And um, Jim laid that out, um, built it, did the signage, and uh, tells the story. The topography in Greene County which, as I said, was wet. If not a big swamp, at least a small one with ponds and wetlands. The third one I want to mention is Spring Lake. And um, there's a photo gallery on the east wall of the back room that tells the history of S Spring Lake from being um, just a lake and then going on to now it is a resort area and has been for many years. Uh, there's a large exhibit back there about the Harker Farms and um, with photos, again, posters, history, signage, and Greene County's early outstanding um, farmer, rancher. Mr. Harker farmed a thousand acres. Now that's not a lot for today's farmers or it's a median, but in that day, a thousand acres when it was being farmed with horses was a lot of land. Uh, he raised some outstanding steers, and I don't know how many, but uh, we have photos of two of them, and uh, they stood seven feet tall. One of them weighed 4,000 pounds. They were shown at the Greene County Fair in 1888, and then went on traveling uh, shows throughout. Um, he was also an inventor, and he uh, invented an early combine, and other farm machinery. And he did not take out patents on any of the things he uh, did. This is a must-see exhibit, and particularly for our farmers in this area. <clears throat> the other one I want uh, to mention is, um, it's already been covered, but it is the, uh, the map of Greene County. And, um, its components, but we will want to gift each one of you with the map as you leave today. And then um, throughout the museum there's other small heritage pieces that Jim has donated, and again with the history and the signage. And he is so unusual then that when he gives us a gift, he brings us the history and the signage. It is complete, it is ready to show, and that really has not happened, I don't believe, with any other donor, to my knowledge. Um, and lastly, I want to say, and as Chuck has already said, um, when we need information, we dial his number, and there's a cheery hello on the other end, and he shares his wealth of knowledge with us. And, Jim, I just want to say, we appreciate you, we cherish you, and we thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Dean. Did I get that right? A steer, seven feet tall, 4,000 pounds? Right. Think what of you livestock producers ought to get one of those going. <laughs> I mean, think what an attraction that'd be at next summer's fair. <laughs> Amazing. Um, our next speaker here today is a good friend of mine. We do quite a bit together. Uh, Dan Towers is the director of the Green County Conservation Board and has worked with Jim on several projects over time. And so, Dan Towers. You wanna... Does this work no. without the mic? Yep, uh -huh. both. both. For the room, you got Okay. You don't have to speak directly. Okay. All right. Uh, like Gene, I was very honored to, to be uh, involved with this today for Jim. Uh, I'll start with, I guess, in 1958, when the, when the Board of Supervisors created the County Conservation Board, one of the responsibilities included the preservation of significant historical aspects of Greene County. I became director here in 1985 and started reading, that was my first exposure to County Conservation Boards, and read that part about the historical significant parts, which I've never been into history a lot. Um, but it didn't take me long to realize that there was somebody on board already that had done that and, and beyond. Uh, probably the first thing that I uh, stumbled into when I, when I became director here was this same publication that Chuck and Gene have talked about. Um, in the courthouse I ran into one of those and it didn't take me long to realize what a, what a treasure this is. Um, and I'm going to sound redundant, but the colorful parts of that, um, it makes you want to read more. I, I've read history before that seemed dry and um, you just didn't want to pursue it any farther, but that, I, I mean, I couldn't wait to see what the next event, the next event was. Um, everything from how many muskrats were sold in 1906 and the value of them. <laughs> um, there wasn't anything left out. It, I'm, it's it's going to appeal to almost anybody that reads that. My first real involvement with Jim was um, when, we, when the county acquired the former Milwaukee Road right-of-way and depot um, to be used for recreational trail use later on. But uh, initially, the, our first venture was getting it acquired and rehabilitating the depot that was there. And I, I knew of Jim, but I had never met him yet, and it didn't take him long to find me. I think when he got wind that um, the county was in possession of that, uh, important part of our history. He showed up in my office one day and introduced himself and from then it was, it was, it made my job very easy. Um, we picked his brain a lot on uh, to be accurate in, in trying to restore the depot the best we could to what it was historically. Um, Eric Strawn deserves a big um, thank you for all the work he did on that. The hours that he spent there, his hourly wage couldn't have been too much I don't think. But um, with Jim, we, we picked through a lot of the details on that and made it what it is today, and I think looks very similar to what it did in the early 1900s when it was built. A lot of the pictures and uh, other things in there, um, Jim provided, and like Gene said, they were already framed, uh, a caption under them and everything. All we had to do was find a spot on the wall for them, so <laughs> I really appreciate all that extra, Jim. Recently, um, that was just several years ago. Jim did a nice publication on, and he titled it, uh, The Memories, Memories of Spring Lake. And a lot of that is what he recalled, and I see he refers a lot to his journal. I think Jim must have kept a journal as a, as a child even. And some of the things that, that um, he explains in Memories of uh, Spring Lake, it makes you feel like you're there. And a lot of the side notes, a little, uh, and there again, it goes beyond the history, um, where he explains how Spring Lake came to be a gravel pit for the, sh uh, the railroad that's uh, now the Union Pacific along Highway 30. There was a crew of 400 people, 400 men, many of them Italians, that made up the crew that was that gravel operation then. And one of his little side stories was one of them apparently became sick from eating an owl and not really, knowing our, not really knowing our language, our English language, didn't know, didn't know the word owl, so he described it as a big-eyed chicken. <laughs> but Jim's accounts are full of things like that, and, and it really just wants you to, to read more. Um, 
And again, I guess the fuel tile thing has already been mentioned, but um, probably 20 years ago, I went to a, a Soil Conservation Service contractors meeting that Jim gave a presentation on uh, the history of tiling in Greene County. And I, I think that is on, is that on video? Was that presentation videoed maybe? I, so. I hope so, I sure hope so, because it was, he had all kinds of artifacts, some of the early tiling equipment, um, pictures, and it, it was one of the most interesting presentations I've ever been in. But that shows uh, the versatility that Jim had, the, the different things he was interested in. It went beyond um, just railroad. And it even goes one step farther than that. Um, Iowa keeps a, rec a record list of the biggest trees in Iowa. The DNR has a registry of the biggest um, of each species of tree in Iowa, and Jim um, still has, and I think probably is still the state record, um, he was the one that registered the biggest red cedar um, in Iowa. It's, on, it's in the Pleasant Hill Cemetery. 1986 was the year that he entered that. So just his interest in things of many different forms, um, it's, it's really made him a valuable part of Greene County and helping record this and and um, making it there for future generations. Um, the markers that are there, I, I travel around Iowa quite a bit for different reasons and I'm always keeping my eyes open for things like that. And I've never seen another county that has the detail and um, the degree, I guess, of accounts of historical things in it. I haven't been to all 99 and looked in them close, but um, I, I'd challenge any other county, I guess, to match what Jim's done with, with all those markers right out on the site where you can look at it and try to picture that scene in front of you. So in the end, Jim, I just want to say thanks for um, being a big part of making my job much easier. Um, and hopefully we can all pick up where you've left off and continue, I guess, because the historical part of our culture is so important. And we would hate to think of our grandkids and great grandkids not knowing some of the phases that got left behind. Thanks. Jim Andrews is just full of those little stories of what you'll be thinking about for days from now after hearing him. The guy got sick from eating an owl. <laughs> oh my. Well, uh, I think many of us probably think that when it comes to history, Jim's first love may be railroading. I mean, I don't, I've never met anybody that's as authoritative as he is on the subject of railroading. And of course, this is all played out that we've seen over the years, we've seen different pieces of his collection, or he's told us different stories about railroading, but this is all played out now in a wonderful way. And you talk about sharing one of our most valuable resources. Uh, we now share with our neighboring county, the East Boone County, the James H. Andrew Railroad Museum and History Center, a fantastic new museum on the Iowa museum scene, something that we're all gonna wanna go over and and uh, experience over there, but it's just been a wonderful addition to life in Iowa, and of course it's great to have it right there at the home of the Boone Scenic Valley Railroad that's such an attraction already. And so uh, to talk a little bit about that today, we're glad to have with us a visitor from Boone, Mike Wendell, who's the curator of that railroad museum and history center. Mike, come on up. Glad to have you here. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. I've enjoyed our visits, Jim. Um, we've, we've been meeting now a few times uh, recently and then from the very start. Um, a little bit of background on myself. Uh, I come from a little town, well actually I come from Chicago originally, and uh, moved out to a small town in uh, western Illinois called Bishop Hill. I don't know for those who are Swedish or have Swedish descent. Um, raised our kids there in an 1855 house and, um, and have been responsible for restoring three, actually four buildings in Bishop Hill that are pre-Civil War structures. So um, I had heard when the museum was going to be built, I was interested and curious to know what it would look like. And I just happened to show up on the day of the groundbreaking, which was absolutely unbelievable for me. Um, I was out uh, just beginning to learn how to be a conductor for the Boone and Scenic Valley Railroad. And in addition to early pioneer Illinois history, I've, been, I've had a great love of railroads and Rock Island has sort of gotten under my skin in terms of its interest to me over the years. And so when the idea of the museum came about, I just found it fascinating and, and um, 
I wouldn't realize that a year later I'd be there. And um, but railroads are quite a draw for me. Um, we've got if you haven't been out there to see the museum, it's wonderful to see. In fact, we've got some information in the back there. There's about 4,500 to 5,000 items there that uh, catalog a lot of different areas of the United States' history with railroads. Uh, a lot of rare, very rare items, um, whether it be a, a, a transit that you might find that would have been uh, early um, surveying instruments to uh, railroad track inspection cars to silverware that someone would have seen on the streamliners from the Union Pacific. Um, Jim has the great eye and really, really collect the things that mean a lot to a lot of folks. So I, I kind of put together this little uh, thing on the uh, importance of preserving railroads. Um, I call it the importance of preserving railroads in Iowa. And so I'll just go through this a little bit. The, in order to study and come to some understanding of Iowa's transportation history, we should develop a respect for lifestyles and people who came before us. By achieving a better understanding of the past, we'll be better prepared for the future. In the words of Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, who lived from 1841 to 1935, he said, and I quote, I believe the greatest thing in the world is not so much where we stand as in what direction we are moving. And the further backward you can look, the further forward, uh, forward you can see. And this applies to contributions made by railroads in building Iowa. I'll begin with a little background on Iowa railroads. Um, there's, they've always been a game changer for the state. Um, since their earliest days. Just as in Illinois, where I come from, um, and other states, the stagecoach ruled travel in Iowa for the longest time since 1838. And the Western Stage <coughs> Company, headquartered in Dubuque, established the first regular stagecoach line serving Iowa pioneers. And service was twice a week from Burlington to St. Francisville, Missouri. And with a 45 mile trip taking, sometimes taking as long as 18 hours. Uh, by 1850, no railroad tracks had been laid in Iowa and the population was clustered in the eastern part of the state. In those days, the Dutch traveled from Keokuk to Pella in 1847, and they used wagons drawn by oxen. In 1854, workers began cutting wood for railroad ties and grading the roadbeds in anticipation of the coming of the railroad. Work was difficult because heavy rails had to be carefully gauged and spiked. And in 1855, a locomotive named the Anton Antoine Leclerc, named for leading citizen of Davenport Muscatine, was brought across the Mississippi by riverboat. Soon tracks reached Iowa's first capital in Iowa City, and much of it completed by the newly formed Mississippi and Missouri Railroad Company. Soon other companies formed and became competitors, and on November 20th of 1855, the Mississippi and, and Missouri Railroad, which later became part of the Rock Island, um, operated the first passenger train ever in Iowa between Davenport and Muscatine. In 1854, the Western Stage Company bought out its competition and became the large, largest stagecoach operator in Iowa. The company controlled all stage traffic on 14 routes of running out of Iowa City, and by the end of the 1860s, the coach lines could no longer compete with the railroads. <clears throat> and on July 1st of 1870, the last Western Stage Company stagecoach left Des Moines, ending this form of travel. Now, early Iowa railroads are listed from the north to the south, southern part of the states are as follows. The Illinois Central ran from Dubuque to Sioux City. The Northwestern ran from Clinton to Council Bluffs. The Rock Island ran from Davenport to Council Bluffs. And the Burlington ran from Burlington to Council Bluffs. The Pacific Railroad Enabling Act, signed by Abraham Lincoln on July 1st of 1862, allowed all this to happen. This law was set up to authorize work on a railroad which would, re which would eventually reach from the East Coast to the West Coast and just happened to be traveling through this great state of Iowa. An amazing boon for a state which is just beginning to grow. After some discussions, Council Bluffs, it was decided, would be the starting point for the Midwest portion of what was called the Transcontinental Railroad. And the Central Pacific, which originated out of San, uh, Sacramento, California, and the Union Pacific, under the brilliant Union Military Railroad architect General Grenville Dodge, his house is still in Council Bluffs, Iowa today. Um, he was appointed by President Lincoln to be the construction engineer for the entire line. Of course, the meeting point of the two famous lines was only made possible by railroad lines through Iowa, which met, as I mentioned, in Council Bluffs. The famous joining of the rails occurred May 10th of 1869 in Promontory Point, Utah, just north of the Great Mormon Migration Site at Salt Lake, with the famous telegraph message tapping out done after the, first last, after the last connecting spike was driven. How? All because of Iowa's railroad connections. 
between 1865 and 1895, Iowa railroads continued to expand rapidly, and by 1895, every county in Iowa was affected by its presence. Between 1895 and 1904, Iowa's railroad track mileage doubled. And railroads played an extremely important role in Iowa's economic development. Due to valuable rail and shipping connections throughout the state, it, was made, po it made it possible to link the east and the west coasts of the United States and provided a valuable economic punch to all Iowa local communities. Iowa farmers were soon able to ship wheat, pork, and livestock beginning in 1861. The lumber industry in Iowa grew as demand for homes, farm, facil farm facilities, and industrial structures increased dramatically. For example, in the city of Clinton, there were five lumber companies and there were 17 millionaires during this time. Iowa's greatest railroad, uh, Iowa's greatest natural resource was its coal fields, and they were located under 21 counties. Without the ability to ship coal throughout and from the state, this resource never would have been utilized to the extent that it was. Tourism and recreation in those early days were very important and made only possible by Iowa railroads. Um, Spring Lake, Spirit Lake, um, Lake Okoboji are just a few examples. And by the 1870s, railroads had a profound impact on all economic structure of Iowa, as well as uh, the service had been established in all major cities by one or more roads. Railroads assisted the United States Post Office with what were ca called in those days RPO cars or railroad post office cars. And the idea of a railroad post office began originally, and I didn't realize this, on a, on a Chicago Northwestern Railroad run from Chicago to Clinton. First time they ever used one. Railroads in Iowa provided many jobs. It took a variety of folks to run a railroad with locomotive engineers, firemen, passenger and freight conductors, porters and brakemen, and folks working in the railroad shops, the roundhouses and depots. And add to this watchmen, section hands, switchers, gatekeepers, agents, and telegraphers. Iowa railroads brought new products from mega cities such as Chicago, which was laced with some of the nation's finest rail connections, and shipped products to some of the uh, farm, uh, many of the farm homes in distant Iowa towns. They grew rapidly as the idea of a new, of the new idea of the Sears Roebuck uh, big thick catalogs that we'd see, and Montgomery Ward's catalogs caught on, and folks in all areas of the nation, for that matter, were able to get goods that they normally wouldn't be able to get, and it was because of railroads. All this contributed to massive building on a variety of levels around the state, and when it came to steam locomotive power, Water for engines were needed at regular intervals. Wherever there was an engine, water stop, and tower, there would in time inevitably be a town built around it as local folks living there felt that it was an excellent place to bring items from town to market, as well as folks living there. Um, they're living there anyway to service the railroad. Some Iowa towns who speculated on where an Iowa railroad might travel sometimes found out the hard way that they were wrong as it bypassed their town. In fact, there's a place, not in Iowa, but in place in Marshall, Michigan that thought it was going to be the seat of the county and all and built all these magnificent mansions and today it, the, the railroad didn't go through there and things didn't actually work out for them like it, they thought it would. But as difficult as it sometimes was, some hardy residents would actually move their pre-built structures near the track so they could take advantage of being located on the run. The electrically powered new inner urbans or locally ca called trolleys in Iowa made their contribution to Iowa rail history and they oftentimes were capable of speeding passengers between Iowa, Iowa cities at nearly 80 miles an hour. There were two prominent, as well as uh, the two longest rail lines in Iowa, the Fort Dodge, Des Moines, and Southern, of which the remnants are the Boone and Scenic Valley Railroad today, and uh, which, by the way, uh, it hosted its inauguration run on July 1st of 1907, uh, in or near Boone, we're not exactly sure exactly the exact location, but somewhere near Boone. It ran from Des Moines to as far east as Newton and as far northwest as Fort Dodge and Rockwell City. And the second, Waterloo Cedar Falls Northern, also called the WCFNN as it was called in those days, began in 1905. It ran from Iowa City north and west to Cedar Falls and north to Sumner. These two operations were the largest in the state. A few other lines such as the Mason City to Clear Lake and the Charles City and Western also ran, as well as the Centerville to Albia. The local farm horse and buggy just couldn't compete with technology like that. In those days, a resident of a small town could turn in any direction and walk and encounter a rail line within 11 miles or run into a depot every 13 miles. The railroad's building zenith in the state had a total amount of approximately 11,000 miles 
but today has only a little less than half that number, but still contributes in a big way by creating jobs and contributing to stabilizing Iowa's financial well-being. And today, in Boone alone, there are still 70 trains that run in and out of the city. Um, the grain train locations in the state offer an affordable al alternative to farmers driving many extra miles in order to sell their product. And while there have been mergers and acquisitions throughout the years, Iowa still has 18 railroads, with the most dominant being the Union Pacific. With ever-increasing gas prices, trucking companies still find it very attractive to ship their semi-trailers on flatbed rail cars, cars as there is not a cheaper way to do so in the nation. Due to deregulation during the last decade, airlines have suffered greatly and were forced to change their business models and profits forever. Remember Braniff International and Air Florida, Continental, Eastern Airlines, TWA, United and American Airlines when they were the big conglomerates. Airlines today are smaller, much more competitor, competitive and offer at best only bare bones services. Many more bankruptcies and reorganizations have become a commonplace as air carriers cut services and are in my mind on the verge of skirting dealing with safety issues because they're trying to cut profits, you know, to try to make profits happen. Situations such as this still point to rail as an attractive, tried and true transportation alternative for Iowa. So when you think of Iowa railroad history and the importance of saving it, think about a cool August 17th morning in 1855 as the first engine to run in Iowa was carefully loaded onto a Mississippi River barge. The captain and his crew had no idea then how their actions would have a lasting impact on Iowa and later the nation. Without knowing it, at that time, they directly contributed to building the great state of Iowa, town by town, city by city, into the state we have today. So it's important that we remember that what contributed and brought prosperity to the state and remember the importance of preserving railroads in Iowa today. And luckily in us, luckily for us, serious historians such as Jim Andrew keep railroad history alive through his wonderful railroad collection for all of us. More than 14,300 visitors since the end of May of this, since it began at the end of May of this year, and as of this morning, there's been 14,300 folks who have come through the museum, which we're really proud of. And um, they visited the Museum and History Center, and this further reinforces the notion that Jim truly is Mr. History. So thanks, Jim. That's fascinating. I, uh, every time you come to the Green County Historical Society's museum, you'll learn something. And I just learned about 10 things about railroads in the course of Mike's uh, presentation. We have 18 railroad companies here still operating in Iowa today. It's amazing. Which reminds me, in the time I've spent with Jim this fall, one of the things, that, of course, all kinds of fascinating things at the Andrew House, but this exhibit right over here that's on this easel is the depots of Green County. And before you leave today, be sure you get up here and see this. And I want you to pay special attention, and any of you Scranton folks will remember this probably, but Scranton had an amazing depot. That you got to see it up here on this. It's all the depots in uh, Green County that ever existed, and there's going to be a few in towns that you have never heard of, so uh, be sure to check those out. Well, old scout, you about ready? I'm ready. We're going to talk about those bicentennial programs and see if we can go talk you into going out and firing that cannon before this afternoon's over. <laughs> James O. Andrew, take it over. First of all, thank you. I'm going to back the wheels up even further than that, and I'd like to say, number one, I am probably the most relieved man in the room. When you're the son of Mr. History, you dread picking up the phone at our house, and they only get the son, not the man. <laughs> so, the more that Chuck and Sean have videotaped the fantastic Green County History book, all of that has greatly relieved me from future anticipation of someday having to take the place and I gotta tell you my long-term memory is not near as good as my dad's on remembering any of this so I had a unique childhood uh, I can remember how I resented at the young age of 11 years old being told Jimmy you're no longer gonna sit over around the swimming pool all afternoon you've got a seat in that pickup truck with me every summer day and you're going to ride around and watch and do everything I do. Well, that was kind of hard to leave those young ladies sitting by the pool to go <laughs> ride with Dad. But let me tell you, I have had a life experience unlike anybody else. I probably know some of Dad's stories better than he does. 
and I can put some other twists on him that he doesn't know about, but it has been really a very, very fine childhood and our opportunity to work together for years. I think part of Dad's interest in putting on programs, I've always heard stories of a Jefferson undertaker by the name of Clyde Slinninger. And you've got to think, for some of us that don't remember the days before radio and TV, how starved people were in the small towns and country churches of Greene County for entertainment. And I always heard great stories about Clyde would do a lot of traveling and maybe take some pictures. And of course he had the chairs available at the funeral parlor. He could have the crew haul him wherever he was. And he was always willing at the drop of a hat to put on a show of his latest travels because it was good for business. Well, Dad must have attended many of those, and I know he got taken to a few Chautauqua programs, which were on a little higher intellectual brow, where they would talk about issues of the day, and they would have a general family-oriented program, very Christian-oriented, and that's where your Chautauqua Park gets its name. So. When I was a boy growing up, I was real active in Boy Scouts. And one of the particular merit badges that I, that I enjoyed uh, qualifying for was Bugling Merit Badge. I told Wayne Lautner that I, I can't do it anymore and I'm glad he can. <laughs> Dad had the idea that it would be great to put together a program where he was the narrator and then he would say, Jimmy, play Charge or Jimmy, play Reveille. Well, I think probably the most unusual time we put that on was for the father-son banquet at the Methodist Church. And I've always watched that somebody had had a video camera to record the reaction of the old church ladies working in the kitchen, which was removed, when the first bugle call went out. I bet they just about dropped all the dirty dishes and couldn't believe, you know, this is a church. We weren't allowed to even square dance hardly in there. So... Uh, that had to be quite a remarkable thing. Over the years, we've had a lot of opportunity to uh, do programs like that, but it kind of it, it kind of reminded me of the old uh, vaudeville teams. You know, we had to break up the act when when I took off and went to college and three years in the army. But when I came back, unbeknownst to me, in 1975, I kind of felt relieved that my mother and father decided to take the first trip away because I was back to run things and they headed out east and they didn't tell me at the time but they had stopped in Philadelphia Pennsylvania where dad had found the address for a tailor shop a tailor shop that made authentic military uniforms for Hollywood for historical museums and for the reenactors when they returned home, a couple weeks later, some great big cartons arrived at our doorstep. And I had no idea what was going on. And so Dad proceeded to open them, and contained therein were these two uniforms. Now I had no idea at the time who was going to wear that white Frontiersman uniform. <laughs> but I, uh, I was enlisted on the spot, and uh, so we did put together a rather fast-moving program and it was just dumbfounding how uh, much fun we had going around to everybody from 4-H groups to uh, church ladies uh, society to uh, all the service clubs in Jefferson and of course dad was the uh, kingpin as the ranking officer he would do a lot of the narrative but then I would jump in and give the old backwoods militiamen uh, interpretation of things. The only thing I thought was incorrect in that display is that white linen is too clean. It should be so stinky and covered with mud that you wouldn't be able to see it at, uh, at night. Um, one thing that was interesting is the stories that Dad told about that tailor shop. Uh, it was in a rather down and out portion of Philadelphia and I guess my mother almost had to wait in the cab and she was not very comfortable with that, but he got in and went up an elevator three flights in an old rundown building, really kind of wonder if I got myself into, and then the door opened to the uh, tailor shop, and inside, I understand, there were all these, I believe they were Armenian tailors, the old type sitting on top of the bench, and they were sewing all these uniforms, and you could virtually go in and you could ask for any 
uh, period, Civil War, Revolutionary War, and they had books that you could pick out, I want to be this uh, a general in the army in the Civil War or whatever, and they could outfit you completely. Back to this Revolutionary War, we hit the trail and we started putting on our presentations. Um, it's remarkable when you look back and you think of the timing of all this. Now this is the man that was building monuments during the day, <coughs> loading up with his son and cleaning up to maybe go to a noon or an evening meeting and put on a show, and then putting on his work clothes and gathering his crew and going up and taking the uh, forms off a monument at Spring Lake or Squirrel Hollow or wherever. So. 75 from uh, January to the middle of summer was a busy, busy, busy time. And we were pretty darn worn out and awful glad to see the 4th of July come because I believe, according to records, we put on something like 56 shows. And I've got to say that uh, at that time, I was really impressed being invited to the big city of Fort Dodge to talk to the Fort Dodge Rotary Club. But it was one of those things you didn't want to do too good a job because then they might ask you to go to Des Moines and Sioux City. And <laughs> so we kind of shut the act down after that and it's basically been stored uh, since those days. But uh, it was a delightful time and uh, the shows were a big hit and we certainly enjoyed doing them. And I've got to say, looking back, it was probably one of the most unique experiences that any father-son team could have and though we're not uh, Hope and Crosby, uh, I had just as much fun doing it. So thank you, Dad. Thank you. I should say, I don't know how many other members of the family we've got here. Jane and Karen are right here, right? And uh, stand up. Daughters and Jim's sisters. James O's wife, Jackie, sitting right over here. We've got their daughters back here, right? Glad to have you all here. Uh, now, to show you that it's not just us in the historical society who are grateful for all that Jim Andrew has done for our organization and for the preservation of history in this county, I want to call forth Mary Jane Fields, the chairperson of the Green County Board of Supervi Supervisors, who has a special recognition. Mary Jane? <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, I have the privilege of doing something for you rather than le he tell he telling everyone what you have done for us. The Board of Supervisors last Monday passed this proclamation and I will read it to you. And it's all the legalese. Whereas James H. Andrew has been a lifetime citizen of Greene County and whereas he has spent his lifetime experiencing and studying the history of our county to the point that he is now the most knowledgeable person in the county about our history and whereas for the last 40 years or more he has worked tirelessly as a volunteer in presenting and interpreting that history for generations that have come after him showing them how fun, how interesting, how sometimes heartbreaking and how often amazing our local history really is and Whereas he has donated hundreds of valuable documents, historical artifacts, memorabilia, and more to our Greene County Historical Museum and to the James H. Andrew Railroad Museum and History Center in our neighboring town of Boone. And whereas he has been instrumental in documenting our historical sites throughout this county with both markers and a detailed map. Therefore, we as the Greene County Board of Supervisors in our official capacity representing the citizens of this county do hereby on this 22nd day of October 2012 recognize James H. Andrew as Greene County's Mr. History and we join the Greene County Historical Society in a program recognizing all of Mr. History's contributions by declaring that the date on that program October 28, 2012 will be hereafter remembered in Greene County history as James H. Andrew Day. <laughs>
Yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to take a moment for pictures here. <laughs> speaks, uh, I'm going to, we're going to turn it over to get a special bit of inspiration from Wayne Lautner, and then I'm going to wind up the program with a couple of remarks, and then just so you can be thinking about this as we're leading into it, we're going to serenade Jim as he's wheeled back to the reception line, and so the song we will be serenading with him with is, I've been working on the railroad. <laughs> so everybody get ready to sing. Rick Moraine has that one ready to go for us. So. I think that's rather appropriate. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, all right. Jim has told me, by the way, that health is really remarkably great for being 91 years old. So he's just got a little hitch back in the tailbone area from too many hours on a tractor seat. <laughs> I think he could wear us all out practically. <laughs> now let me get this down. So, are you going to hold the mic, or are you? Uh, yeah, that'd be fine. Okay, I think. Well, I'll have to correct that I'm 91 years, six months, nine days. <laughs> when you get to this stage, why well, you really start counting. That's <laughs> the accurate. Well, after all the kind things and generous comments that have been made, I feel like I ought to be running for public office. <laughs> Everybody else is. <laughs> I've made some comments for you here that I think are fitting for an elder person anyway. Uh, <clears throat> I've lived rather a quiet life for the last 15 years, but the last two years it seems like there's been an awful lot of uh, excitement. We've had the uh, publication of the Green County Heritage book, and we've had the uh, Boone Railroad Depot, and of course this occasion here today, so it's been quite a change for me. But uh, I've had a lot of people that ask me, particularly this year, how 2012 compared to years in the past, you know, relative to the drought and to farming and to the uh, hot days that we had and so forth. And my reply has been that uh, 1934, seemed to have been the most troubled year in my memory. Uh, I was a young boy at that time and I kept a daily diary and so I've been able to take uh, the following points from that diary so I'm more accurate maybe than my memory would be otherwise. But uh, 1934 was near the middle of the Great Depression. We had low prices for farm products high unemployment, many banks had failed, and quite a number of farmers had lost their farms. And meanwhile, insurance companies were selling top land in Greene County, which they had repossessed, at a price of $65 an acre. So compare that to today's land prices for Greene County. Unbelievable, isn't it? <clears throat> The spring of 1934 was extremely dry and hot. We had just a half an inch of rain in April, another half an inch in May, and then finally in late June, two inches of rain. The result was that the three months of April, May, and June just turned up two and 97 hundredths of an inch of rain, less than three inches of rain when normally we would have over 11 inches, so you get an idea of, with a situation with only one-fourth the rain that you would normally expect. Now, the result was that uh, there were many acres of corn that had to be replanted 
because people wanted to put it in deeper where they might get the seed down to moisture. And in our case, I remember that we planted a large garden with beans and peas and that sort of thing. And they didn't come up until about the 1st of July, laid there in dry dirt. <coughs> Many farm wells went dry and creeks started running, stopped running. And in our own personal case, why we had a house well just right by the back door of our house and that went dry for a period of about five or six months and we had to make a long trip to the windmill for all the water that we needed in the house which was quite a uh, added burden. But here's an interesting thing. Then came the dust storms. We had 10 days of bad dust storms in April and three days in May. These were storms that started in the Dust Bowl area of Colorado and Kansas and Oklahoma and Texas and they brought up yellow and reddish soil from those areas and uh, you could really see that it was dirt that had come a long ways to get there. It was an unusual situation because our uh, barn was about 200 feet from the house and in the worst of these storms, we were unable to see the barn from the house because of the dirt in the air. Another thing that was kind of amusing was that our chickens were even fooled by this because it would get so dark out that uh, they would go to the chicken house and roost thinking that night had come. <laughs> then on uh, June the 27th and 28th of that year, it was 111 degrees in parts of Iowa, and I think that's probably about as extreme uh, heat that we ever have known in the state, so an unusual situation there. The uh, crops were troubled with grasshoppers and armyworms. We had a close by neighbor that had 20 acres in a field of oats, and uh, when we threshed there, they made a yield of four bushel per acre. And he had used three bushel an acre to seed the field to start out with. So <laughs> that was a real money loser. My father's yield was better at 15 bushel to the acre. At that time, we had a 32 volt Delco light plant with batteries which were installed back in 1917. It furnished us with electric lights, ran a washing machine with an electric motor, and we had powered a radio, which we purchased in 1926 with this battery system. But around 1931, the batteries wore out, and after 14 years of electric lights, we had to go back to kerosene lamps and another situation was that we had enjoyed a radio for five years and we went four years without a radio after that. So you kind of went from riches to rags, so to speak. <laughs> <clears throat> well, back in uh, that fall, we cut half of our corn acres for fodder and the remaining half, which would have been about 45 acres, which was on better ground, made 22 bushel to the acre. My father paid three cents a bushel for canned corn huskers at that time. Now back in 1934, when old timers were asked about bad years, they would talk about the drought of 1894, taking place 40 years earlier. <clears throat> now in the second vein, I've often been asked about improvements in farming and farm life. For men, I regard the modern tractor and combine cabs as the greatest improvement in farming in my lifetime. Starting back around 1973 with John Deere, they came out with an improved cab that let a farmer work in a reasonable quiet situation and with heat and air conditioning as needed away from exhaust fumes, rain, snow, cold, heat, wind, and dust. He was protected from the danger of a tractor rollover and had a fine hydraulic system to raise and adjust heavy farm implements. A good radio 
kept him informed on the grain market prices and the current weather forecast. Country music and talk shows furnished hours of entertainment. <laughs> A CB radio system allowed him to communicate with home base and with other employees in tractors, grain trucks, and pickups. But lastly, a well-designed upholstered seat made the long hours more comfortable. <laughs> My 50 years of active farming were spent with sitting on steel seats the first 25 years, and then I had the luxury of cushioned seats the last 25 years. And believe me, I know the difference. <laughs> My son Jim, finished his military service early in 1974, and I strongly encouraged him to come home and join our farming operation because I felt tractor cabs were making such a great improvement in a farmer's life. <laughs> My answer is different for the farm ladies. The construction of rural electric service starting in 1938 brought tremendous changes to most farm homes. The movement for electricity in Greene County for farmers was led by the Farm Bureau and a group of volunteer farm men beginning in 1935. <coughs> in the fall of 1938, three years later, the first farms received electrical energy. My father Norman was one of the first promoters and in later years he served as president of the Green County Rural Electrification. A basic requirement was for two farmers to be signed up for each mile of line needed to be built. In a neighborhood with many land-owning operators, this was much easier than in a community with landlord-tenant farmers. The landlords would be reluctant to pay the cost of having the farm home and buildings wired for electricity. Eventually these problems were worked out and by 1950 all the farms in Greene County desiring electricity had been serviced. But this came after a big delay in 1942 to 1946 for World War II. Think of the improvements to farm homes with electric lights, radios, and eventually TVs and computers. Many installed a water pressure system, a modern bathroom, electric water heater, washing machines and clothes dryers, electric stoves, refrigerators, air conditioning and deep freezes, and the many small appliances like electric clocks, record your record players, toasters, roasters, mixers and blenders and so on. What a great improvement this made in rural living and in the same time many small town merchants profited by selling and servicing the above devices. Everyone was a winner. I'm giving two items from my railroad collection to the Greene County Historical Society today. The first is a collection of the various depots that were in Greene County through the years. And the second is a photo right to the right of it there, which shows the construction of the high bridge over the Raccoon River west of Jefferson about 1900. Now this is rather an amazing photo because it shows how the new bridge was built over the top of the existing bridge and as a result, they were able to contain, continue train service with a minimum of delay. I want to sign off by saying that I'm so pleased with this museum and the good work that all of you people have done through the years to keep it up. It's been a real wonderful teaching aid, I'm sure, to young people in the community to come here and see the things that their parents and grandparents are acquainted with. And of course, it's the thing that continues on. There's new things that need to be added all the time. And uh, it's an interesting also to observe that we will have been in this building 10 years in March, I believe. So uh, it's an anniversary coming up to kind of be celebrated because this has been a wonderful improvement for the Historical Society and for the entire community. And once again, I thank you everyone and all for being here today and for the generous and 
kind remarks that you have had for me. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. 1934. We thought this year was a tough year. <laughs> Amazing. Well, now as we can move on, uh, yeah, Jim. May I say something before you finish? Sure. I got a loud mouth, so I don't need that. Jim, I need to publicly thank you. I taught in middle school for 38 years. And at one time, I wanted to make English more fun and exciting. And your granddaughters will remember this. I used your packet there many, many, many years. And I went through there and I thought, I put a little dot by each thing I want to talk about. When you get that book, look at the, the bank in Parliament. They refused, they couldn't get in the bank. Safe. It's past dating material. Thank you very much. I, it's fantastic. And I copied it, 100 copies every year. And so I owe you a dollar for I copy every copy. <laughs> so I gave you a dollar. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was a fantastic book. Jim North is figure fast enough to that because I'm pretty sure he's got a record. <laughs> well, what we want to say to wind up this program, I think it's appropriate that we have a charge, and that's why I'm turning this over now to Wayne Lauder. Wayne? I've got to tell this story. We were, at this point in this program, seriously, we were going to have you turn your attention and we were going to open these doors and outside was going to be, is it Alpha Sigs? The Alpha Sig fraternity canon from Iowa State <laughs> University was going to be out here and we were going to fire a volley in salute to James H. Andrew. And so I called the fraternity president and we had agreed that we could make this happen. And then I thought, well, I better check this out with law enforcement. <laughs> and so just to make you feel good about the city and the county you live in, I called up Mike Palmer, the city administrator, and I said, do you suppose it's okay if we're shooting a cannon off down by the museum on Sunday afternoon? And Palmer said, let me work on that. And he called back and he said, well, we found out it's against the law in Jefferson to discharge firearms in the city limits. But it doesn't say anything about artillery. <laughs> and so we were a go at that point, but then Gene Burke or someone or Virginia Carlson, somebody had the good sense for the Historical Society to check our insurance company. <laughs> that didn't think it was a good idea at all. In fact, they said if we fired that cannon, we'd be looking for a new insurance carrier. So we have no cannon here today, but we've had our charge, and here's, here's, the, here's the message that we all need to carry forth. One thing is, is as we present and interpret history going forward, we need to have, to do something that Jim Andrew has always done so well. We need to know our audience. We need to anticipate what people are going to want to learn when they come in here or at our building at the fairgrounds or at our historical marker sites around the county. Know our audience and serve it. The second thing we need to do is do exactly what Jim Andrew has done at least the last 40 years, but really all of his life. Recommit ourselves to telling those stories and preserving those stories so they can be told, told decades from now to the Green Countyans who will succeed us all. We've had a great model in that, in James H. Andrew, and we'll be forever appreciative of that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Now, pro program is complete. We are going to, Jim's gonna lead the procession back to the reception where we have free refreshments for everybody. But as he goes back there, Rick Moraine is going to, Wayne, you can jump in on this if you know it, but Wayne, Rick Moraine's gonna lead us into I've been working on the railroad, so here we go. Mm -hmm.
coming. Thank you for a great program. Thank you guys.